This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 48. Coming up on Space Time. Rare meteorites challenge our understanding of the solar system. The volcano that almost wiped out the human species still alive and active today. And no universe without the Big Bang. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers may need to revise science's current understanding of the early solar system following the discovery of rare minerals in ancient meteorites. A report in the journal Nature Astronomy claims the new finds mean the history and evolution of the solar system may have been somewhat different from what scientists previously thought. Scientists discovered unusual mineral grains in 43 meteorites, which landed on Earth some 467 million years ago. More than half of the mineral grains are from meteorites which are either completely unknown or extremely rare in today's meteorite flow. The new discovery supports earlier research into an unusual meteorite known as Osterplaner 065, which was discovered in a Swedish quarry. Meteorites are pieces of rock that have fallen to Earth from space. They're formed out of the debris of collisions between celestial bodies such as asteroids, moons and even planets. And there are heaps of different types of meteorites, each reflecting the different compositions of their parent bodies. By studying the different meteorites which have made the way to Earth, scientists can develop a better understanding of how the basic building blocks of the solar system formed and evolved. One of the study's authors, Professor Berger Schmitz from Sweden's Lund University, describes Osterplaner 065 as evidence of an extinct meteorite. The term extincts being used to describe this meteorite because its unusual composition is quite different from all other known groups of meteorites. And that indicates that the progenitor asteroid from which it came must have been very different from most known asteroids in the solar system. Schmidt says little is known about the meteorite flux to Earth in geological deep time before this study. In this particular project that has now been published in, in Nature Astronomy, we have made the first reconstruction of the meteorite flux 470 million years ago. For the first time, we can reconstruct what type of meteorites that fell on Earth in a very, very distant past. The conventional view has always been that the solar system's been pretty stable over the last 500 million years, most of the action taking place early on during the first first half a billion years. So it was rather surprising to find that the meteorite flux at 467 million years ago was so different from the present day. To better understand the ancient meteorite flux over 467 million years ago, the authors looked for meteorite samples which had fallen to Earth before that time. The problem is such finds are rare. Nevertheless, Schmitz and colleagues were able to find 43 micrometeorite samples. Micrometeorites are tiny specks of space rock, usually less than 2 millimetres in diameter, and they're somewhat more widespread, if you know where to look. In this case, the samples were retrieved from rocks which originated in an ancient seafloor, which is now exposed in a Russian river valley. The rock that we have studied, we, we sampled in, uh, in Russia, east of St. Petersburg. There is a section that has very, very slowly formed sediments from this time period. Then we transported the, the rocks here to, to Sweden, and then we dissolved them here in our lab. Once back in the lab, the bedrocks were dissolved in a range of acids, leaving behind microscopic chromite spinel crystals crystals containing the mineral chromite. We have developed a method to dissolve really large chunks of rocks like one ton, thousand kilograms from like uh, one thousand kilogram of rock. We can recover like on the order of one hundred relict mineral grains from meteorites that fell on the seafloor in the past. They're a little like time capsules which have remained unaltered for hundreds of millions of years. The chromium oxides were then analyzed to identify their composition in oxygen isotopes. That made it possible to determine the type of meteorite the grains would have originated from. The analysis of the chemical makeup showed that the meteorites and micrometeorites which fell to Earth earlier than 466 million years ago are very different from the ones which have fallen since. In our sample, uh, we find many meteorites that are very rare on Earth today. A full 34% of these meteorites belong to a meteorite type called primitive chondrites. 
And that's interesting because today a chondrites account for less than 0.45% of all the meteorites that reach Earth. If you ask most astronomers today, they will say that the solar system has probably been very stable over time periods of 500 million years. But our really surprising result is that, that it was completely different meteorites. The, the meteorite flux was dominated by other meteorites than those that are common on Earth today. Other ancient micrometeorites sampled in the study turned out to be relics from the main old asteroid Vesta, which underwent its own cosmic collision about a billion years ago. So, the study shows that the flow of meteorites may have been dramatically different 470 million years ago compared to today as meteorites with such a composition no longer fall on Earth. I think it was generally been believed that it would never be possible to reconstruct the meteorite flux in, in, on, on the ancient Earth because meteorite falls are so rare. But this, this method seems to give uh, decent results. According to Schmidt, scientists always assumed that the solar system was reasonably stable and they therefore expected to find the same type of meteorites in roughly the same proportions throughout the solar system's history. This new study means that's not the case. It means that something so far unknown, but still fundamentally important to the history of our solar system, occurred nearly 500 million years ago. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study has concluded that the Toba supervolcano, which is held responsible for almost wiping out the human species 74,000 years ago, is still alive and active today. A report of the journal Nature Communications is warning that the rare but spectacular eruptions of supervolcanoes experience ongoing smaller eruptions for tens of thousands of years after the initial event. The Toba super eruption almost wiped out humankind. It certainly changed human evolution forever, and the evidence for that is found in every strand of DNA in every human alive today. The Toba eruption caused a global volcanic winter lasting at least 10 years, which had the effect of reducing human populations to as little as just 2,000 breeding pairs. The remains of that cataclysmic event can still be seen today in the Toba caldera, a 100-kilometre-long, 30-kilometre-wide lake on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. The study's lead author, Adonara Mulkek from Oregon State University, says the recovery of a supervolcanic eruption is a long process, as the volcano and its magmatic system try to re-establish equilibrium. At Toba, it appears the eruptions continued for at least 15,000 to 20,000 years after the super eruption, and the structural adjustment continued until at least just a few centuries ago, and is probably still continuing today. Mulkek describes it as the magmatic equivalent to aftershocks following an earthquake. This is the first time that scientists have been able to pinpoint exactly what happens following the eruption of a supervolcano. To qualify as a supervolcano, a volcanic eruption must reach at least a magnitude 8 on the Volcano Explosivity Index, which means the measured deposits for that eruption are greater than 1,000 cubic kilometres. When Toba erupted, it emitted a volume of magma some 28,000 times greater than that of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Other well-known supervolcano sites include Yellowstone in Washington, the Taupo caldera in New Zealand, and Italy's Campi Flegre. Supervolcanoes are thought to have lifespans lasting millions of years, during which time there can be numerous super eruptions. But between these major eruptions, they don't die. Scientists have long speculated that eruptions continue after the initial super eruption, but this is the first time they've been able to accurately place ages on those eruptions. Previous Argon dating studies had provided rough ages for the eruptions at Toba, but all those eruption dates included a fairly broad error range. The new research looked at the most recent volcanic history of Toba by measuring the amount of helium remaining in zircon crystals in the erupted pumice and lava. The helium remaining in the crystals is a remnant of the decaying process of uranium, which is a well-understood radioactive decay path and half-life. McKeck says Toba is at least 1.3 million years old. Its super eruption took place 74,000 years ago, and it's had at least six and probably several more definitive eruptions after that. The last eruption appears to have occurred about 56,000 years ago. But there are other eruptions which still remain to be studied. The researchers also managed to estimate the history of the structural adjustment for Toba, using carbon-14 dating of lake bed sediment that had been uplifted to about 600 metres above the lake in which they formed. 
These data show that structural adjustment continued from at least 30,000 years ago until just 2,000 years ago and may still be continuing today. The study also found that the magma in Toba's system has an identical chemical fingerprint and zircon crystallization history to Mount Cinnabung, an active volcano located just 50 kilometres away. Cinnabung is currently erupting and it's quite distinct from other volcanoes spread across Sumatra. Now all this suggests that Cinnabung is simply part of the Toba system, which means Toba must be far larger and more widespread than previously thought. So the data suggests that the recent and ongoing eruptions of Mount Cinnabung are part of the Toba system's recovery process from the original super eruption. It's worth pointing out that the discovery of this connection doesn't suggest that the Toba caldera is in any danger of erupting on a catastrophic scale anytime soon. The authors say it's much more likely to be just a case of business as usual for a recovering supervolcano. However, it does emphasise the importance of having more sophisticated and frequent monitoring of the site in order to measure the uplift of the ground and image the magma system. The lessons from this research is that the hazards of a supervolcano don't stop after the initial eruption. They simply change to more local regional hazards, such as smaller eruptions, as well as earthquakes, landslides and tsunamis, all of which can continue for several tens of thousands of years. It's also worth pointing out that as large as the Toba eruption was, the total reservoir of magma under the caldera is much, much greater. And studies of other calderas around the Earth, such as Yellowstone, have also estimated there are between 10 and 50 times as much magma in these chambers as what's erupted during a super eruption, meaning there's plenty in reserve. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Scientists using data from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter have identified bright areas in craters near the Moon's south pole cold enough to have surface frost. The new findings, reported in the journal Icarus, are based on an analysis combining surface temperatures with information about how much light's being reflected off the Moon's surface. The study's lead author, Elizabeth Fisher, who was with the University of Hawaii at the time of her research, says she found that the coldest places near the Moon's south pole are also the brightest places much brighter than what one would expect from soil alone, and that could indicate the presence of surface frost. The icy deposits appear to be patchy and thin, which means it's possible they're mixed in with a surface layer of soil, dust and small rocks known as regolith. The authors aren't seeing great expanses of ice similar to a frozen pond. Instead, they're seeing signs of what really looks like surface frost. And that frost was detected in cold traps close to the moon's south pole. Cold traps are permanently dark areas, located either on the floor of a deep crater or along a section of a crater wall that doesn't receive direct sunlight, places where temperatures constantly remain below 163 degrees Celsius. And it's under these conditions where water ice can persist for millions or even billions of years. More than half a century ago, scientists first suggested that lunar cold traps could store water ice. But confirming that hypothesis has turned out to be somewhat challenging. Observations made by NASA's Lunar Prospector Orbiter in the late 1990s identified hydrogen-rich areas near the Moon's poles, but could not determine whether that hydrogen was bound up in water or whether it was present in some other form. Understanding the nature of these deposits has been one of the driving goals of NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has been orbiting the Moon since 2009. Fisher and colleagues found their evidence for lunar frost by comparing temperature readings from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's Diviner instrument with brightness measurements from the spacecraft's Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter, or LOLA. In these comparisons, the coldest areas near the South Pole also turned out to be very bright, indicating the presence of ice or some other highly reflective material. The researchers looked at peak surface temperatures because water ice won't last long if the temperature creeps above a crucial threshold. The findings are consistent with another team's analysis of Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data reported back in 2015. 
That study compared peak temperatures with ultraviolet data from the Lyman Alpha Mapping Project, or LAMP. Both LOLA and LAMP are able to measure surface brightness without sunlight. LOLA does so by measuring reflected laser light, and LAMP by measuring reflected starlight and the UV sky glow of hydrogen. Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Project scientist John Keller from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says the new findings demonstrate the value of long-term orbital study of the Moon. That's because all this work begins with comprehensive data sets made up of years' worth of continuous measurements. Together, the two studies strengthen the case that there is frost in coal traps near the Moon's south pole. However, interestingly enough, scientists have so far not found similar signs near the Moon's north pole, and that's raising its own questions. Study co-author Matt Siegler from the Planetary Science Institute in Dallas, Texas, says one of the things which have always intrigued scientists about the Moon is that they expected to find ice wherever temperatures were cold enough for ice to form. But that's not what they're seeing. Water ice and other deposits have also been identified in cold traps near the North Pole of Mercury. Though it's the closest planet to the Sun, it seems Mercury has at least 400 times more ice than the Moon does, and scientists are still trying to figure out which scenario is normal. Another tantalising question is how old the Moon's ice is. You see, if the water was delivered by icy comets and asteroids, it could be as ancient as the solar system itself, some 4.5 billion years. And that means it could well be a marker for the early delivery of water to both the Earth and the Moon. On the other hand, if the water is produced by chemical reactions driven by the solar wind, it would be much more recent. Then again, maybe both could be true. There could be eons old ice deposits buried below ground and newer water deposits on the surface. In any case, there's enough evidence now to argue for further investigation. Not only could the moon's ice provide a resource for exploration, it could also help scientists better understand the origins of Earth's water as well. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. One of the principal goals of cosmology is to understand the origins and early evolution of the universe. And data from the European Space Agency's Planck satellite mission shows that some 13.8 billion years ago, the universe consisted of a hot and dense soup of particles, and the universe has been expanding since then. This is the main tenet of the so-called hot Big Bang theory. But the theory has a major flaw in that it can't describe the very first stages of the universe's formation itself. That's because the conditions back then were simply too extreme for today's physics to be able to understand. Indeed, as we approach the Big Bang, the energy density and the curvature of space-time both grow until they reach a point where they become infinite. In fact, Professor Albert Einstein's relativity theory tells us that the curvature of space-time was infinite at the time of the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. The problem is, science's mathematical understanding breaks down at that point of singularity. Not only don't we know what, if anything, happened before the Big Bang, we don't know what the Big Bang, and for that matter the universe it created, is expanding into, leaving scientists with a rather unsatisfying answer that the cosmos is simply expanding into the future. However, scientists have always hoped that the beginning of the universe could perhaps one day be described in a simpler way, a way which avoids the incalculable infinities of the Big Bang. Sadly, a new report in the journal Physical Review D has dashed those hopes, finding that the Big Bang in all its complicated glory retains its mystery. The idea of a simpler cosmology description goes back to the 1980s No Boundary proposal developed by James Hurdle and Stephen Hawking and Alexander Vilenkin's tunnelling proposal. However, the new research by scientists from Germany's Max Planck Institute and the Perimeter Institute in Canada has concluded that neither of these hypotheses can work. Both the no-boundary and tunnelling proposals assume that the tiny early universe arose through a process of quantum tunnelling and then subsequently grew into the universe we see today. In its simplest terms, quantum tunnelling involves the likelihood of a particle being found at a specific place. It describes how the chances of that happening might be extremely small, but they can never be zero. The curvature of space-time would still have been large but finite in this beginning stage, and the geometry would have been smooth without boundary. This initial configuration could then replace the standard Big Bang. However, as satisfying as it sounds, for a long time now the true consequences of this hypothesis have remained somewhat unclear. 
Now, with the help of better mathematical methods, Jean-Luc Lears, Job Philbrook and Neil Turak managed to define the 35-year-old theories in a precise manner for the first time, allowing them to properly calculate their implications. However, the results of these investigations have concluded that the alternatives to the Big Bang simply don't work. As a result of Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, these models do not only imply that smooth universes can tunnel out of nothing, but so too can strange regular universes. In fact, the more irregular and crumpled they are, the more likely. In its simplest terms, Werner Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that the more precisely the position of a particle is determined, the less precisely its momentum can be known, and vice versa. In quantum physics, a quantum fluctuation, the temporary change in the amount of energy at a point in space, is explained through Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It allows the creation of quantum fluctuations, virtual particle-antiparticle pairs that pop into existence for a short period of time and then just as quickly pop out again. We know these virtual particle pairs of quantum fluctuations are real thanks to demonstrations by the Casimir effect. A small attractive force acting between two close parallel uncharged conducting plates caused by increases in quantum vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. You see, if the two conductive plates are close enough to each other in order to prevent virtual particle pairs popping into existence between them, then the only virtual particle pairs popping into existence will be those beyond the two plates, thereby providing increased pressure forcing the plates together. Lenners says the no-boundary proposal doesn't imply a large universe like the one we live in, but rather tiny curved universes that would collapse immediately. Hence, one cannot circumvent the Big Bang so easily. Lenners and colleagues are now trying to figure out exactly what mechanism could have kept these large quantum fluctuations in check under the most extreme circumstances, allowing our large universe to unfold. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. An Ariane 5 rocket has carried its heaviest jet payload into orbit. Ariane Space Flight VA-237 blasted off from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, carrying the Viasat-2 and Utelsat 172B telecommunication satellites into geostationary transfer orbits. À tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3... Well, no doubt about it, night has turned to day, and the rumble in the Amazon jungle is that mighty Ariane 5 ECA. She's roaring out over Devil's Island. One minute uh, into flight coming up, and the Ariane 5 has already broken the sound barrier here in Karu. The massive Jupiter facility would have been shaking as 1,300 tons of thrust breaks the Ariane 5 free from the bounds of Earth's gravity. 90% of that power is coming from the two boosters burning 240 tons of solid propellant in two minutes, better than two tons a second. When the boosters have done their job less than a minute from now, Ariane will be over 70 kilometers in the sky, racing away from us more than uh, 1.6 kilometers a second. And that's faster than a speeding bullet. Information coming to us now from the Galat. The pilotage is calm, the trajectory is nominal. Right behind us here in Jupiter. The next major event, the burnout and the jettison of those two solid rocket boosters. That will happen at 2 minutes and 20 seconds into the flight. So about 10 more seconds. The propulsion is nominal. Give us the horsepower. And then they will extinguish and fall away. Separation des deux EAP. And there you hear it from the. Trajectoire nominale. The boosters have done their job. We don't need them anymore. 
On the pad, the Ariane 5 weighed 780 tons. We're down now to 100 In the rocket business, when you get lighter, you go faster. And Ariane is now really moving on out about 91 kilometers uh, into the sky. Next up. The jettison of the fairing, it's covered the satellites on the ground and protected us from friction in the early part Le pilotage of the flight. Est calme, la propulsion est nominale. And we don't need it uh, anymore. It is going to be separating in uh, a couple of seconds. Separation coif, trajectoire and nominale. Here the DDO say separation coif. The fairing falls away. We just lost another two tons. And uh, with the fairing gone, Viasat 2 is exposed to space for the first time. While the launcher is technically in space, La propulsion we est nominale. Have a long way to go. The main cryogenic stage, or EPC, is burning. It'll burn for nine minutes. The heavy lifting being done by the mighty Vulcan engine Le pilotage going est calme. down 320 kilograms, about 700 pounds of fuel a second. That's 500 times more than a jet engine that you probably flew down here to Kourou on if you're here in the audience. La propulsion est nominale. The number one question I get from people is uh, when I tell them, hey, you know, I'm going to French Guiana for a rocket launch, they scratch La their head, they say, why French Guiana? Well, the Kourou space base is about 300 miles north of the equator, and the Earth rotates faster here than it does, say, at Kennedy Space Center. Thus, the Ariane 5 gets a huge boost from the Earth's rotation, allowing satellite operators to uh, launch heavier payloads, add more fuel to their birds, increase operational life, meaning more revenue. Uh, tonight, we're using five tracking stations. Galat, that is here. Natal in Brazil. Then out in the middle of the uh, Atlantic Ocean is Ascension Island. We use that uh, tonight. Lieberville, Gabon, on the west coast of Africa. And Acquisition de la télémesure Lancer par la station de Natal au Brésil. What happens is Arian sends data to those ground stations, and that gives us the uh, flight data in real time on how it's progressing. La EPC, propulsion est toujours nominale. The uh, flame on the end of the EPC begin to uh, flicker. Fin de propulsion de l'étage à propulsion cryogénique. And Séparation de l'EPC. But it's separated, and the upper stage has fallen. Allumage de l'étage supérieur cryogénique, trajectoire nominale. And everything is nominal, and that means the main stage has done its job. It drops into the ocean off Africa. The upper stage will burn for about 16 minutes. We're going pretty fast now. La propulsion now. est nominale. The five is uh, well on its way. The 6,418 kilogram Viasat 2 was released 29 minutes after launch followed by the Utelsat 172B 12 minutes later. Built by Boeing on a 702HB platform, the Viasat 2 will provide extended broadband coverage to North and Central America, as well as the Caribbean and North and South America. It will also provide services for aeronautical maritime routes across the North Atlantic Ocean, between North America and Europe. Its suite of KA-band transponders provide nearly twice the capacity and seven times the coverage area of earlier Viasat satellites. The Viasat 2 carries enough fuel for a design life of more than 14 years. The 3,551kg Airbus-built Utelsat 172B satellite is based on the new all-electric Eurostar E3000 EOR, or Electric Orbit Rising Platform. The spacecraft's equipped with both KU and C-band transponders, providing telecommunications and broadcasting services, as well as in-flight broadband and maritime connectivity across the Asia-Pacific region from Alaska to Australia. The satellite carries enough fuel for a design life of more than 15 years. The total payload mass for this launch, including payload adapters and carrying structures, was a record-setting 10,865 kilograms. The flight was the third launch from Kourou in under a month, the 93rd Ariane 5 mission so far, and the 289th launch for Ariane Space. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, 
Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favorite podcast download provider, or direct from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. The show's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's In Flight Entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook just go to www.facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. Space time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.